The tiefling was tall and lean, his skin of his face smooth and dark brown. Geth would have said he was probably a little bit older than either Ekas or Dagi, possibly even around his own age. It was difficult to tell because his eyes were solid golden orbs, without white iris or pupil, descendants of ancient mages who had bargained with devils. Tieflings showed the taint of their ancestors' bid for power. Tenkiz's strange eyes were echoed in gold flecks on the polished, heavy black horns that curled back from his forehead above dark, wavy hair. Horny spikes edged his chin in imitation of a sharp goatee. He wore a kind of long vest embroidered in an intricate labyrinthine pattern over a much laundered shirt and brown leather trousers. In the back, vest and trousers were cut to make room for a thick, fleshy tail, brown like his skin. If it exists in Dungeons & Dragons, it has a place in Eberron. In this Library of Kornberg, we're again opening a book on the core races of Eberron. Which races are core? Since 5th edition is current, the ancestries that appear in the 5th edition player's handbook, human, elf, including drow, halfling, dwarf, half-elf, gnome, half-orc, tiefling, and dragonborn. And then there are the ones that appear in Eberron Rising from the Last War. Warforged, Changeling, Shifter, Orc, Goblin, Hobgoblin, Bugbear, and Kalistar. These have been consistently the most important playable races in Eberron since its inception. All of the information provided here is based on canon material, counting Keith Baker's published writings from the DM's Guild. If there are any small changes to the information, it is done to smooth over edges between materials from different editions and writers. Like the previous entries in the series, which covered Humans of Eberron, we'll look at the in-world history of tieflings, their cultures and religions, dragon marks, how to play them, including their subraces. Tieflings are diverse in appearance, depending on the source of their dark heritage. Traits associated with fiendish creatures like demons and devils are pronounced. The most common of these are horns and unnatural skin tones, eyes without sclera, and hooved feet. Some may get variations or additional features tied more directly with certain planes or specific fiends. So a tiefling who was born near a manifest zone, Fernia, may have fire-red hair, or slowly emit smoke with no visible source of heat. A Mabari tiefling may cause lights to slightly dim when they are near, have fangs, and may have vestigial wings. A tiefling tied to Rakshasas might have short fur or have backward hands. The variety is endless. The most important thing to know about the history of the tieflings in Eberron is that there is no one kind of tiefling. Much like their opposites, the Asimar, tieflings have a number of potential sources for their physical and magical differences from other humanoids. For tieflings, there are four ways they might have received their form, and each have their own history. Asimar were covered in the first Outside the Core episode, the I Am the Corner will take you there if you missed it. Planar tieflings are born to normal everyday parents and are usually a surprise. The baby has taken on traits neither parent possess, but instead they received it by absorbing ambient energy from one of the planes, usually because the parents live in or near a manifest zone. Even more rarely, these traits could develop in adolescence or adulthood among those living in these same conditions. 
They are slightly more common in Sarlana due to the prevalence of manifest zones on that continent. As they are rare and generally solitary members of their species, and not grouped together, planar tieflings don't really have a shared history that we can go over. These are tieflings very close to how they exist in many core D&D settings. They are people who had a fiendish heritage some number of generations ago. So like a great-grandmother was a succubus, or a chain devil great-great-grandfather, and some of the magical genetics of these parents passed along through the generations until it was diluted beyond the point that they would be considered cambians or half-fiends. They would still have horns or some other features about them that was somewhat fiendish. These tieflings are quite rare and have little shared history. Like the planar tieflings, most are born near where people and fiends interact, so in planar cities like the Amaranthine City or near manifest zones. They may also be the result of intentional human arcane experimentation. The Demon Wastes is a unique place in Eberron, in that the fiends of Kyber are able to emerge from the depths and openly interact with people. The majority of the non-fiend population of the Wastes are roving bands of mostly humans that are called Carrion Tribes. Saka tieflings are born to the Carrion Tribes through the same processes as planar tieflings, though due to the fiendish nature of the region rather than due to extra planar influence. It might also be possible to see some genetic tieflings here too, and they would be considered Saka tieflings as well. The last major group of tieflings are the most populous variety. Descendants of a group of people from the nation of Orkaloon, now a province of Rirdra. The leaders of Orkaloon mostly worship the Dark Six, and some went further to traffic with fiends. The Orkalunians built up a massive lust for magical power, driven by a desire for forbidden knowledge and paranoia of their neighboring nations and other scheming nobles. A group of noble arcanists, both wizards and warlocks, made dark paths beyond the strength of even a standard warlock pact with devils for greater power. This resulted in a large part of them and their family's form being transformed. Some became skulks to allow them to evade and assassinate their enemies. According to at least one story, changelings were created in these packs, though this is disputed. The majority took on the fiendish form of tieflings. This pact was so strong it passed along to their children as well, along with a well of fiendish magic they could draw upon. This power allowed them to fight wars against their neighboring nations and quarrel amongst themselves. They built themselves maze fortresses dotted across the islands of Orkaloon, and these were almost unassailable. Then, between 15 and 1700 years ago, they saw the rise of the Inspired and spread of the unity of Rirdra across Sarlona. This was accompanied with persecution of arcane magic and attacks on Orkaloon, intent on wiping out the potential rival to the power of the Inspired. Many Orkalunians fled east, as they didn't believe, despite their magic, that they could oppose the will of the rest of Yerdra united. A few remained, believing the war mazes would protect them. In many cases they were correct, though their ability to project political power outside of the mazes was gone, and Orkaloon became a province of the united Yerdra under the Inspired. The remnants of the Orkaloon nobility eventually began dissident cells against the Inspired, calling themselves the heirs of Orkaloon, operating in deep secret and practicing forbidden magic. A few of their number are tieflings, but most are human and skulks. They are now spread out across the continent and don't just operate in Orkaloon itself. They work in secret to increase their own power and undermine the Inspired. Of the refugees that fled to Corvair Split, 
many of the humans spread out among the rest of the human population of Corvair. But the majority of the tieflings found a new hidden fortress in the west, in the marshes just south of Blackwater Lake, in what is now Droham. They called their new fiefdom the Venomous Demean and used their magical power to keep it largely unknown to outsiders. That is, until recently, when it came to be known to the daughters of Sora Cal. And at that point, the ruler of the Venom Lords, Behalmolesh, allied the Demean with the new nation of monsters and began loaning tiefling forces to Dosk, Catra's voice, and Therese's eye. The Demean is not well known outside of Drum, but the fiefdom is now visible to the outside world for the first time. Solo planar and genetic tieflings are rare enough that they don't have their own cultures to speak of, and they are usually just mixed in with the many other races. In Sharn, most people wouldn't take a second glance at a tiefling, possibly thinking they are just a small minotaur, or one of the many other races that live peacefully in the city. They are sometimes shunned on a personal level, but more because of their dark powers in practice, and the strange effect they might have on the world around them and less because of their look. In Sarlona, it is more likely they will be seen as a body holding an altivar spirit, trapped for punishment as part of the path of inspiration, similar to how Oni and even shifters are seen, subhuman. There would be a belief that service in the Taskin Legion would bring them enough positive effect that they might be able to help the spirit inside them elevate to a new form in their next life. Saka means touched ones in the tribe's fiendish local language, and Saka are seen as blessings to their tribes, and often rise to leadership positions. Influence of the fiendish lands is strong, so the majority of the Carrion tribes are full of cruel people who hunger only for power. The Gosh Galak lands who prevent fiends and the Carrion tribes from leaving the Demon Waste by way of the Labyrinth along the southern border of the Demon Waste don't use the name Sokka for tieflings. Instead, they call them Sakvanarak, meaning fiend-touched. Some Sokka tieflings reject their fiendish background and carry in tribe upbringing and defect the Gashkala. It's not uncommon for these tieflings to be more devout and fight even harder than their comrades to protect the world from fiendish invalids since they know that tug of darkness coming from within themselves, and what it takes to fight it. The Tiefling Lords of Venom in Corvair, and the heirs of Orcaloon in Sarlona, both independently look to preserve their culture from Orcaloon. So they retain the paranoia, cruelty and repressive feudal government, and still retain much of their ancient arcane knowledge. Forms of magic unknown for centuries may be practiced here and nowhere else in the world. The population of the Venomous Demean is made up of both humans and tieflings, though the nobility is pulled solely from hereditary nobles, who are all tieflings. Historically, humans were able to sometimes leave the hidden land to trade work as mage rights and bring in outside resources. And it is clear that the culture that they share with the tiefling population bears little kinship with the wider world of Corvair. The Domine is overall repressive and dour, and the leaders are often cruel and obsessed more with maintaining their power than increasing the lot of life of its people. This mindset is extended to much of the people, both humans and tieflings who live there. Though now that things are more open with the rest of the world, some attitudes may begin changing. Tieflings will generally follow the path that the culture around them does. A planar tiefling growing up in Ondair will most likely follow the Sovereigns and Six, for example. It's only in the demon wastes 
and in the lines of Orkaloon, where we see some more specific tendencies I'd like to call out. Most Sokka are indoctrinated into the spirit cults followed by the Carrion tribes they were born into. These fiendish spirits can usually be traced back to an overlord of one kind or another, or sometimes directly to one of the Lords of Dust. The tieflings who have joined the Gashkala follow a religion based around the binding flame called Kalak Shash, though outside researchers believe this is an independently developed faith in the Silver Flame due to the many beliefs held in common between the two faiths. The Colonian tieflings of Sarlona and the Venomous Demean still mostly follow their old form of worship in the Dark Six, which is not uncommon in Droam, with some directly forming fiendish cults dedicated to the devils that transmuted their forms ages ago. And fiendish cults are not exactly uncommon elsewhere in Droam either. Tieflings are not considered one of the dragon marked races of the world and do not manifest true dragon marks. It could be possible that an aberrant mark might emerge, but there is no instance of that happening before in Eberron's history, so that would certainly be a momentous event. Tieflings have a history of being playable with just core books going back to 3rd edition. They were playable in 2nd edition as well, but you need Planescape material for that. Though sometimes you could get a bit creative. Let's review what options you have in each edition. In 3rd and 3.5 editions, the Tiefling had playable race stats included in the Monster Manual. Now one quirk of that rules edition was the same statistics used to generate player characters were used to create antagonists and monsters. That meant some racial stats were quite a bit more powerful than the races that appeared in the player's handbook. The way they balanced that was with a level adjustment. Basically by saying that a level 1 character of that given race was equivalent to a higher level character. Tieflings were assigned a level adjustment of plus 1. So, for example, a first level tiefling fighter was considered by the rules as about equally powerful as a level 2 elf fighter. This unfortunately meant that the characters of this race usually had to be left out of campaigns starting at level 1. The Player's Guide to Eberron wanted to work around this by adding a few feats that allow a player to effectively play a Sokka tiefling from level 1 by making your actual race whatever you want, but then you can take one of three feats that represent the touch of the demon waste on your form. You just need to be from the waste on story terms. At this point, the Saka Tieflings were the main form of Tieflings established in Eberron, though a few planar Tieflings were mentioned briefly in a few other books. There were a few Tiefling-like races, like the Tanaruk, that were present in books for other settings, but these options aren't really well suited to play in Eberron based on established canon. The Tiefling got upgraded to the Player's Handbook in 4th edition, and were easily playable without doing any special workarounds like level adjustments. Because they were now a more essential part of the setting, the authors of the Eberron Campaign Guide and Player's Guide added the founding of the Venomous Domain, and the Tiefling transformation to the already existing story of the Fall of Orkaloon. To give potential Tiefling players more options for their origin, no mechanical distinctions between the various types of Tieflings were made, though, for this edition. While 4th edition had a lot of content, Directed to Tiefling characters, there were no major sub-races or anything of that ilk added. In 5th edition, the Tiefling is again playable out of the player's handbook. However, a number of variant sub-races were created over the course of a number of books. These options mostly just changed which ability score increases the Tieflings received, changed their energy resistances, 
and swapped out which spells they inherently knew. These are somewhat obsolete at this point, since as of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, player character races are allowed to all use more flexible assignments of ability scores. But let's look at all of these anyway. Tieflings of specific fiendish heritages appeared in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes contained a raft of options based on heritage going back to specific archfiends. The Sword Coast options might make sense for the rare genetic tiefling character in Eberron, but the archdevil options don't really thematically fit any of the Eberron tiefling types closely in my opinion. There are a few Eberron specific options in Morgrave Miscellany that are worth mentioning. In that book, it does establish that the player's handbook rules match up with Kaluian tieflings, and they created subraces for Saka and planar tieflings connected to Dolor, Fernia, Kithri, Mabar, Rizia, and Shavarath, and each had different ability score increases, resistances, and spell selections for each plane. If you're looking into tieflings affected by different planes than the ones in Morgrave Miscellany, you might want to look at that point for something that might match better from Morden Kanan's Tome or the Sword Coast book. Okay, so before we close the book on tieflings for now, let's discuss how to apply the dump of knowledge here when you're creating a new tiefling character. Assuming you're creating a PC who is operating as an adventurer, first talk to your DM and other players to let them know what type of expectations for the campaign might be, and likewise listen to them about the expected tone and character of the story itself to help you guide you and your choices. Then, with that perspective, you need to figure out your origin. Kaluni and tieflings are going to be the most common followed by Sokka, and then the planar and genetic ones. Sokka are going to be the best for telling a story of overcoming the narrative of your birth and background, and of course for stories tied to the Lord of Dust or the release of an overlord. Kalunian tieflings are suited to stories about the search for ancient magic, forbidden knowledge, etc. They also work well in stories based out of Droam, or with the Daughters of Sorakel as the group's patron. They are also very well suited to Infernal Pack Warlocks, renewing the ancient seal their ancestors made. Planar Tieflings are the one of the many varieties of Tieflings, most likely to feel persecuted by the wider world, so are good to explore the type of story where you overcome the glances and shunning and save the world anyway. All varieties of tieflings can be used if you just want to be the menacing outsider who may or may not have a heart of gold and need to overcome their darkness. So, as we close our books and leave the Library of Kornberg, I hope you've found something here that makes you want to play a tiefling in Eberron or drop a new NPC into the campaign you are dungeon mastering. On the next video here on the Eberron Archaeologist, we're reviewing the first adventure product released for the setting, Shadows of the Last War. Get subscribed so you don't miss it. And check out the channel's Instagram and see updates on the channel and weekly posts showing detailed photos of Eberron minis.